the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Roots of Reconstruction by Rusas John Rushduni Narrated by Shelby Luke This is a Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Please visit calcedon.edu to download this and many other articles by Rusus John Rushdie. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Shelby Luke, and I will be reading from Roots of Reconstruction by Rusus John Rushdie. The Opposite of Sin, Calcedon Position Paper Number 33 Sometimes the best way to understand the meaning of an idea or concept is to know its opposite. Thus, the opposite of night is day, which tells us something about both night and day. The opposite of life is death, but if we say it is freedom, we reveal a suicidal disposition. Some psychologists have used this matter of antonyms, opposites in words, to understand the mental state of patients. This means of understanding has other uses, including philosophical and theological ones. Our concern here is biblical and theological. Ask yourself this question. What is the opposite of sin? The answer is not a new one. It goes back to the Bible, and Proverbs especially sets opposites together to help us understand what God means. This teaching method was used in Israel and it still continues to a degree in Jewish educational forms. The church once used it, but has abandoned it. To return to our question, what is the opposite of sin? The Old Testament Hebrew has several words for sin. Chatha, Avon, Pesha, Ava, and more. The New Testament Greek uses especially Harmashia and Anomia. These words mean failure, blameworthiness, iniquity, rebellion, or transgression, and crooked. They have reference to a wrong done to God or to man in violation of God's law. The Westminster Shorter Catechism summarized it thus, quote, Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God, unquote. 1 John 3, 4. The opposite of sin is a commandment obeyed in faithfulness, or, in terms of current Hebrew, a mitzvah. A mitzvah is, in its primary sense, a commandment of God is set forth in His Word. In its secondary sense, it means our faithfulness to God's law, our act of faith and obedience whereby we manifest the grace and righteousness of God. To, quote, do a mitzvah, unquote, was thus to obey the Lord. One folk proverb said, quote, One mitzvah leads to another. Unquote. In origin, the word mitzvah is derived from a Hebrew root meaning quote, to command unquote, or quote, to ordain. Unquote. It has reference to God's law word. Most people are familiar with the word quote, mitzvah unquote, from the rite of bar mitzvah when boys at the age of 13 plus one day 
and girls in the bats mitzvah at the age of 12 plus one day publicly acknowledge their duty to keep the commandments of God. This rite in some form is very ancient, and it was continued in the church in the rite of confirmation. It is very regrettable that confirmation is becoming a less and less educational process, or in some churches has been dropped entirely. A study is long overdue on the purpose and place given to a child by the bar, bat, mitzvah, and by confirmation. Here we have a cultural fact of great importance which has been ignored by historians. The opposite of sin is a commandment by God, the whole of God's law word. As we have seen, sin is any one of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. Saving righteousness, justifying righteousness, or justice is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to the every word of God and His atoning death and resurrection as our vicarious substitute and head. Sanctifying righteousness is our faithfulness to the law word of God. The child from its earliest days is taught that certain things are forbidden and certain acts required. The world is governed by, quote, thou shalt not, unquote, and also by requirements, quote, this shall ye do and live, unquote. By chastisement and by discipline, the child is taught the right way and barred from the wrong, while being told that one's only justifying righteousness before God is in and through our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Then, with Christian schooling and in some form of mature confirmation of the faith in his own life and experience, the young man or woman is now ready for adult life, for maturity, quote, to do a mitzvah, unquote, to use the old phrase. It is at this point that the church, like the synagogue before it, has failed. College and university graduates are regularly told that their real schooling is just beginning. More correctly, they should be told it should now begin, but, for the most part, they settle into the routines of their life and learn as little as possible thereafter. The same is true in the church. One pastor, who visited a former charge after more than 25 years, found it a joy to see old friends, but religiously a discouraging experience. Despite the many years, there were too few evidences of growth in Christian faith, knowledge, and action. In the intervening time, they had been served by pastors who were able teachers, but they had been content to remain babes in Christ. If the opposite of sin is the commandment or law word of God and doing His will, this means that Christian action in the world is the antonym of sin. The Christian community has a world responsibility. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We have forgotten what was once a very important doctrine, vocation. It means seeing our life and work as a calling from God to serve and obey Him. A famous poem by George Herbert set forth this doctrine. Teach me, my God and King, in all things Thee to see, and what I do in anything, to do it as for Thee. A man that looks on glass, on it may stay his eye, or if he pleaseth, through it pass, and then the heaven is spy. All may of Thee partake. Nothing can be so mean, which with this tincture, quote, for Thy sake, unquote, will not grow bright and clean. A servant with his claws makes drudgery divine, who sweeps a room as for thy laws, makes that and the action fine. This is that famous stone that turneth all to gold, for that which God doth touch and own cannot for less be told. W. R. Forrester in Christian Vocation, 1953, called attention to the fact, quote, in language after language the same word is used for toil and childbearing, e.g., labor and travail, page 129. Both are burned with the curse of the fall, Genesis 3, 16 through 19. But the two are the essential key to any possible future for man. Both are the purpose of God for man, and with man's redemption becomes man's blessing, Psalms 127. Our Lord says, quote, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work, unquote. 
John 4:34. By this he says that a man's soul, a calling, is the sustaining thing as food is for the body. Luther said, quote, What you do in your house is worth as much as if you did it up in heaven for our Lord God. Therefore, we should accustom ourselves to think of our position and work as sacred and well-pleasing to God, not on account of the position and the work, but on account of the word and faith from which the obedience and the work flow. No Christian should despise his position and life if he is living in accordance with the word of God, but should say, I believe in Jesus Christ, and do as the Ten Commandments teach, and pray that our dear Lord God may help me thus to do. Unquote. Calvin in his Institutes, Volume 3, Chapter 10 and 6, spoke of, quote, the boiling restlessness of the human mind, unquote, and our need of a calling. This calling is of God's appointing, not our daydreaming. Quote, Every man's mode of life, therefore, is a kind of station assigned him by the Lord, that he may not always be driven about as random. So necessary is this distinction that all our actions are thereby estimated in his sight, and often in a very different way from that in which human reason or philosophy would estimate them. In everything, the call of the Lord is the foundation and beginning of right action." Unquote. This calling, doing God's will and living in terms of His law word or commandments, is life to the faithful. One of the sharpest and clearest comments about this came from James Chalmers, missionary to New Guinea, in the very earliest days of that mission. Quote, Don't send us men who talk of self-sacrifice. Unquote. We must say with Christ, quote, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Unquote. Hebrews 10, 9 because life apart from our calling of faithfulness, of obedience, is not life for us. The psalmist knew what it was, quote, to do a mitzvah, unquote. He sang about it, quote, Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night, and have kept thy law, unquote. Psalms 119, 54-55 Again, quote, O how I love thy law! It is my meditation all the day, unquote. Psalms 119.97 To have a calling without faith in God and obedience to His commandments is evil and even demonic. Oswald Spengler, in The Decline of the West, saw the decline and destruction of the West and the rise of ambitious men with purely secular callings. He saw the socialist of the future as the arch-imperialist of history, and of Cecil Rhodes, he said, quote, Rhodes is to be regarded as the first precursor of a Western type of Caesars whose day is to come, though yet distant. Unquote. The demonic Titanism which Spengler, writing in 1914 through 1918, saw in the world's future came much earlier than he had predicted. Socialism, both national and international, has become imperialistic. Fascism and Nazism, and especially the Soviet Union, Cuba, Libya, and other Marxist states have been history's bloodiest powers. Since 1975, in its brief history, Marxist Cambodia, or Kampuche, has executed half of its population. At the same time, as Carol Quigley has shown in the Anglo-American Establishment, Books in Focus, 1981, the heirs and followers of Rhodes have devastated the rest of the world with their sickly idealism. If our calling, our mitzvah, is not to do the will of him that sent us and to finish his work, John 4.34, we are faithless to our Lord and dangerous to society. To have a calling without and apart from God's law word is to be a deadly menace to other men and to society. The opposite of sin is to do the commandments in faith, to confirm our faith in action. This means the Great Commission, the conversion of all the world, the discipling of all nations, the application of God's law to every area of life, and the recognition by every sphere of the Lordship of Christ. Forrester called attention to the difference between vocation and ambition. Vocation allies itself with the Lord 
and places itself under the every word of God. Matthew 4, 4. A vocation is the result of regeneration and faithful obedience. It sees freedom as obedience to the Lord. Ambition is marked by lust for power and preeminence. The ambitious man seeks to use God and man to gain his own ends. The ambitious man assents to the great temptation and says, I shall be my own God, determining or establishing for myself, in terms of my will, what constitutes good and evil. Genesis 3, 5. The man with a calling says with our Lord, quote, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Unquote. Matthew 4, 4. The ambitious man, because power is his God, will slaughter kulaks, persecute Jews, capitalists, whites, blacks, or workers, exploit all men, treat youth as cannon fodder, and generally dedicate himself to what, in terms of God's law word, is sin, and only sin, however noble a cause he may ascribe to his action. Most sins come labeled with a noble rationale. Sinning is usually called liberation, and murders in the cause of sin are usually called victories over the enemies of the people, the state, or the great cause. As against this, our Lord says, quote, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Unquote. Matthew twenty-two, thirty-seven through 40 On these two also hang the future of society. For the man with a godly vocation, this is the way of life. The doctrine of the priesthood of all believers is inseparable from the facts of confirmation and doing a mitzvah and vocation. A work of some years ago on confirmation spoke of the training for and the right of confirmation as having this goal, quote, the professing of the faith, unquote, in all one's life and actions. Thomas Wilson, 1663 through 1755, Bishop of Sodor and Man, in his Sacra Privata, wrote, quote, He lives to no purpose who is not glorifying God. Unquote. We glorify God when we keep His commandments, do His will, and rejoice in our calling in Him. The opposite of sin is doing the commandments in faithfulness. Quote, Faith without works is dead. Unquote. James 2, 14-26 Our Lord speaks clearly on this. Quote, not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Unquote. Matthew seven twenty one, August, nineteen eighty two. Sin, confession, and dominion. Chalcedon position paper number thirty four. By early summer of nineteen eighty two, it was clear that the feminist equal rights amendment to the U.S. Constitution was dead. The movement perished in part because of its own excesses. These excesses were born out of the mythology of modern man and man's view of himself as a victim rather than a sinner. Of course, ever since Adam and Eve, people have chosen to plead an innocence born of environmental premises. Adam and Eve both pleaded victimization. Their own hearts were good, but the environment led them astray. When the women's liberation movement made half the human race into victims and the other half into oppressors, it pushed the myth too far. One woman, in an impassioned book, portrayed all men at heart as rapists. Sadly, some clergymen, in reviewing the work, praised it. One wonders at their mentality, and certainly their womenfolk should. In another highly praised book, another feminist wrote, quote, when a female child is passed from lap to lap so that all the males in the room, father, brother, acquaintance, can get a heart on, it is the helpless mother standing there and looking on that creates the sense of shame and guilt in the child. Unquote. Prestigious publications praise this garbage, but attitudes like this have helped weaken the old foundations of humanistic thought which has made us all into victims and also all into oppressors. 
If we are male or female, we victimize some time. If we are parents, we warp children. If we are rich, middle class, or poor, we somehow are responsible for the evils of our time. Responsibility, denied by environmentalism, has a habit of reappearing. We may be victims of our environment, but because we are someone else's environment, we are guilty, not for our own sins, but for someone else's sins. This places us in an ugly predicament. Our own sins we can do something about, but we cannot do much about the sins of a man down the road. The doctrine of the conflict of interest and Darwinism has greatly increased the problem. Class or race, or religious, or social warfare is assumed to be basic to the human situation. The, quote, superior, unquote, group is then by definition the oppressing group. If you are rich, you are by common assumption the oppressor of the poor. If you are white, you are a racist. If you are a male, you are guilty of sexism, and so on and on. But sin is common to all of us. Marx portrayed the capitalist as the oppressor of the working man and the debacher of the working girl. Of course, this did not keep Marx, the socialist, from debauching his wife's maid, nor modern socialists from doing the same. Women executives can be as guilty of sexism as men, and as zealous in their pursuit of underlings. Moreover, the plain fact is that maids have often seduced their masters or their master's son no less than masters have seduced maids. Sin is not a property belonging to any race or class, nor is virtue. We have long been subjected to the myth of the innocent or oppressed class. Films and television have treated us ad nauseum with tales of whores with hearts of gold. For film writers, it would seem that the one qualification for virtue is to have no virtue. We are shown a world of sorry victims who are the casualties of life having been exploited by someone. It is at this point that modern thought is meeting with disaster. It denies the biblical doctrine of sin for a concept of an evil environment. We are all victims, but because we are all somebody's environment, we are all an evil force which needs bulldozing out of the way. Out of such an impasse, men see no escape. For some years now, we have seen a growing disaffection and taste for modern thought on the part of the very children of our modern leaders. The student rebels of the 1960s came largely from liberal and permissive homes. They were indeed the children of the establishment. The rebellion of the 1960s has given way to cynicism and indifference. There is a dropping out into drugs, liquor, or simple existence without relevance. I talked briefly in the past year or so with the son of a prominent father whose mother is also a part of the intellectual community. His parents were both dismayed, he said, because he had quit the university after less than two years to take a job. When I asked him why, he described the university as, quote, just plain S blank blank T. All they do is to lay a guilt trip on you, unquote. This young man was very much a part of the modern culture in his habits and taste, but he had broken with the essence of modernism its doctrine of a man as victim. When he saw his parents, he loved to offend them by his own admission, by ridiculing their belief in the innocence of minority groups, unions, or anything else he could think of, not out of conviction but out of contempt for the modern myth. The homosexuals and the feminists have both exploited the myth, and both are beginning to see the hints of its decline and even backlash. David, in Psalms 8, 4, asked the question of God, quote, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Unquote. To be mindful in Hebrew means to think well of, to consider favorably. In essence, mindfulness has a religious root. God is mindful of man because, first, man is his creation, made in his own image, for righteousness, knowledge, holiness, and dominion. Second, God is mindful of man because he has given man a great calling, the task of subduing the earth and of exercising dominion over it. 
Genesis 1, 26-28. For the performance of this task, God has crowned man, quote, with glory and honor, unquote, Psalms 3, 8, and has placed all things implicitly under man. At least from Nietzsche to Stalin and the present, a major strand of humanism has seen man merely as manure for the creation of the future superman or communistic man or the great society. Virtually all humanism has seen man as either good or as neutral in his moral nature, and hence a victim of God or the environment. This view of man is now in decay. Fraud rightly saw his role as critical in the destruction of the Enlightenment's optimistic view of man. Man, for fraud, is a product of his unconscious, and the unconscious is made up of the ID, the anarchistic pleasure principle, man's will to live, of the ego, the reality principle, and the will to death, and the superego, the teachings and effects of the immediate environment. The ID and ego represent the past environment. Fraud saw little hope for man in escaping from his past. While some of Fraud's ideas are now under attack, his doctrine of man essentially remains in force, and it's contributing to the decay of the world of humanism. In answer to the question, quote, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Unquote, the modern world is answering that it is mindful of ideal man, the man of its imagined future. It is not mindful of independent man, Christian man, resisting man, or any man who refuses to bow down to the state. The modern state says, in effect, be a victim, and we will love you and care for you. But man today is seeing only the breakdown of the humanist order. In a play of 1967, The Hawk, a product of the experimental theater, the, quote, hawk, unquote, is a heroin peddler with an insatiable lust for victims. The hawk's litany is a simple one. He is an animal. He, quote, kills, unquote, because he is hungry. Whatever happens has no moral meaning. We do what by nature we are impelled to do. The world of the hawk is beyond good and evil, beyond morality. It is a world in which all men are victims of their own nature and their nature is a product of the past. In 1970, Michael Novak, in The Experience of Nothingness, said that the fundamental human question is, quote, Granted that I must die, how shall I live? Unquote. Page 48. To this question, the modern mind has no answer. In fact, at that time, Novak himself could only say that there is no self over and apart from the world only a self in tension with the world and a part of it, so that, better than speaking of the self, we should speak instead of, quote, a conscious world, unquote, or, quote, a horizon, unquote. Page 55. Ethics, instead of being God's commandment, was for Novak at that time simply man's, quote, invention, unquote, or, quote, creation, unquote, man's, quote, possibility, unquote page 79. For such opinions, men pay a price, or in Sean Manley's apt sentence, quote, we pay for dreams, unquote, and dreams are broken by reality. Quote, what is man that thou art mindful of him, unquote, has been answered increasingly with a rejection of mindfulness. Men are not even mindful of themselves and suicidal habits are prevalent. To blunt one's mind with drugs or marijuana is certainly a blatant example of unmindfulness. Man as victim cannot confess sin. He can only indulge in self-pity. On the other hand, in the Bible we have a different view. In Joshua 7:19, Joshua tells Achan, the sinner, quote, My son, give, I pray thee, glory unto the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, unquote. The word confession in the Hebrew is toda, which means confession and praise. Thus, when Joshua asked Achan to confess his sins, which carried a death penalty, he was also asking him to praise God. This gives us a glimpse into a radically different world than that of 20th century man, for whom confession means essentially self-abasement and humiliation. In the Bible, the confession of sin is a major step in the restoration of order, God's order 
and it is thus a means toward praising God. The church of our day has lost the meaning of confession. A victim cannot make confession. A man created to be a priest, prophet, and king in Christ finds in confession his restoration into a royal estate and a great calling. Quote, Sin is any one of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God, unquote, according to the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Confession is the first step towards restoration into our God-appointed status and dominion. It is the recognition that we are not victims but sinners, and we are sinners because we have departed from and rebelled against God's mandate and calling. There are indications that, in earlier centuries of the Christian era, monarchs, before their coronation, had to make confession. However falsely done by many kings, its purpose was to remind them that all men are judged by God's law, and the praise of God begins with our confession of sins and our submission to God's law order. It is God's law order which alone can exalt human society and make it joyful and triumphant. David after asking, quote, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Unquote, goes on to say, quote, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Unquote. Psalms 8, 6. The conclusions of true confession is dominion. The restored man as king exercises dominion over every area of life and thought and brings all things into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. The myth of victimization is being shattered. Its own advocates, by pushing it to its logical limits, have exposed its absurdities. It is a myth that has failed, and it is now dying. This, however, is not enough. Clearing the ground of a tottering structure is a need, but it does not erect a new building. What is now needed is a strong and forthright emphasis on Christian Reconstruction, on Dominion Man and His mandate to conquer every area of life and thought for Christ, and on the certainty of victory. For victims, there is no victory. For confessors of the name, victory is inescapable, because God the Lord remains forever King over all creation. Then let us be joyful, let the earth be glad, quote, before the Lord, for He cometh to judge the earth, he shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Unquote. Psalms 96, 13. October 1982. Thank you for joining me this week in the reading of Roots of Reconstruction by Bruce's John Rushman. Lord willing, we will be reading again next week. Until then, may God bless your endeavors as you serve the one and only King Jesus. It was the blood of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the love he had by his pain, the very price. It was there at Calvary's tree, where he died for you.
this love Tell the world how Jesus Christ has set you free Set you free Tell the 